Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Brownfield Curious, Unearthing Potential of Brownfields for Environmental Justice. I'm Julissa Gilmore. I'm the Senior Manager of Environmental Justice Programs at Groundwork USA, and I should be joined by my co-host, John Valench, the Senior Manager of Climate Resilience and Land Use, um, who will lead our Q&A today. So thanks, everyone, for joining. And so our plan is to talk about a little bit about Groundwork USA and our Brownfield Technical Assistance Program, what are Brownfields, Brownfields and Equitable Development, how Brownfields can benefit your community, and then Brownfield Transformation, so share some examples with you all, and then have a, about a 20 minute Q&A, and then share some resources and how to learn more. <laughs> And so Groundwork USA is a national environmental nonprofit that then is a national support organization for over 20 community-based organizations um, that are working to make their communities healthier, greener, just, and more resilient. Our trusts have worked on transforming land and waterways, building climate resilience, youth environmental stewardship programs, and much more. And so our webinar today is hosted by Groundwork USA's National Nonprofit Brownfield Technical Assistance Program with funding from the EPA, um, EPA's okay. Office of Brownfield and Land Revitalization. And so this is a five-year technical assistance program to increase the capacity of nonprofits working in their communities with equitable development, environmental justice as guiding principles to ultimately improve the public health in, in your communities. And so we do this technical assistance with three main components. And so our first one is direct technical assistance. And so we offer technical assistance, and this is mainly through what will be a six month learning cohort that will launch later this year, specifically for nonprofits. We also host webinars and workshops that are open to the public that focus on topics that are relevant to brownfields and environmental justice. And in addition to this series, we'll have a series highlighting nonprofits who are leading brownfield work, um, transformations, and workshops that are focused on um, building knowledge and skills to take on these projects. And then lastly, a resource library that is full of tools and resources to help you begin or continue your Brownfield um, journey. And so this is where the recording will be posted today. And so today, yeah, our, our first webinar of this nonprofit technical assistance program is our Brownfield Curious um, series, which is a three-part webinar series. And it's really to introduce organizations to brownfields and why you can why you should consider taking on a brownfield project. And so this first this first session that we're at today will really just introduce the brownfields process. Like, what is a brownfield, and why should your community even consider um, taking one on? And then the next sessions will dive a little bit deeper into the process of transforming brownfields into community assets, talking about the steps the timelines, funding, stakeholders, um, and much more. And then the last series, the last session in the series, we'll dive deeper into the actual roles of nonprofits in the brownfield space. And so also I wanna encourage everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. Um, yeah, where are you from, you know, and is there a is there a background noise that anyone else hears? I'm seeing in the chat. Feel free to come off mute and tell me if you're hearing any background noise. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, feel free to use the chat and we'll have a Q&A. And so before we get started, just wanted to have this quick poll for you all, three question poll. And so the first question, is which entity do you represent? Are you a nonprofit? Are you a tribal entity, government agency, private sector? Um, where are you all joining us from today? 
Okay. And we'll give it a little bit more time. Okay, so it seems like a lot of mostly nonprofits and government agencies. Okay. All right, well, I'm happy to have you all join us today. So thank you for sharing that. The next question, how would you rate your knowledge of brownfields? Would you say you never heard of them? Somewhat familiar, you've worked on brownfields projects before, significant experience, or you're a brownfield expert. Okay. All right, so a lot of somewhat familiars. Glad to see a brownfield expert in the room. And yeah, if you never heard of them, that's this is the webinar for you. Great. And for those who just joined, where there should be a link in the chat to to participate in this survey. All right. Okay. So a lot of somewhat familiars. Okay. And the last question is, so what are some words that come to mind when you think of brownfields? And I won't give any examples for this one. And so feel free to just type in one, two words. I think you can do a max of three. Okay. Exposure, difficult, pollution, toxic, risk, opportunity, contamination, underutilized, expensive, unhealthy, eyesore. Yeah. Yeah. A big one on potential and contamination and opportunity. Gas stations, lighted. Public funding, dangerous, confusing, environmental justice, red tape, conservation, ugly, yeah, non-active. Okay. So there seems like there's still the contamination opportunity, which is really interesting. It's still the, the kind of biggest ones that we're seeing. Undesired land use challenging yeah yeah thank you all for for sharing your thoughts i think these are some of the things that yeah come up for for me as well all right i'm gonna end it for now but we'll come back to this so what is a brown field and so you all know like, yeah, let's start with the basics. What is a brownfield? So the EPA definition of a brownfield is property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. And so all that really means is that somewhere, or not all it means, but that somewhere in your community, there's land that's maybe vacant or abandoned, or there's uncertainty around the potential chemical or pollution contamination. And that really adds an extra, you know, challenging layer of trying to reuse this land, like a lot of you, you mentioned, um, challenging red tape risk. Um, and so a lot of brownfields are actually typically determined by their, their past use. So some examples can be dry cleaners, railway facilities, automotive repair, um, illegal dumping, agricultural land and facilities, residential properties, um, industry or gas stations and fuel storage. Um, 
Yeah, the the brownfield expert in the room, feel free to share some more in the chat about other typical brownfield past uses and what they may look like in the community. And so say if you're like, oh, you know, I don't really have any old gas stations or former rail yards in the community, but I think I, I might, may have some brownfields, you can also keep an eye out for, you know, cars parked on sites, abandonment or long-term neglect of buildings, visible or burnt foundations of buildings, or just buildings or industry that are partially standing, and not just industry, but even commercial properties or residential structures as well, or drums filled with unidentifiable materials or liquid, former residential homes that are burned or have post-demolition debris um, folded into the land. Um, also, dead animals, if they're found on site, that's a, that's a big warning sign that some type of contamination may, may be happening. And so how did these brownfields come to be? Um, so there's many ways that brownfields came to be, but some of the common ways or reason um, is because of the industrial history of the United States where land regulations that put certain uses in certain neighborhoods, and sometimes those industries moved on, shut down, or were abandoned, um, leaving those properties abandoned or those communities polluted. Um, but also unregulated land use, um, squatting, just vacancy in general, abandonment, tax title, um, structure fires, and illegal dumping can all be other ways that brownfields have come to be in, in certain communities. And so what are the, the impacts of these brownfields? Why are, why are they concerned? I think from, again, what a lot of you, you put in the, the word cloud, I think a lot of you have an idea, but there's 450 or over 450,000 brownfields estimated in the U.S. And a lot of them are predominantly located in communities of color and low income, low income communities. And so this really hinders investment in already long um, marginalized neighborhoods. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of, you know, it's hard to redevelop these properties or, you know, no one wants to to take on the risk that's associated with potential contaminated properties. Um, it perpetuates vacancies, eyesores, more illegal dumping, um, and in general just detracts from, you know, the neighborhood sense of place, the health and well-being. Um, and especially the health, there's, you know, potentially a lot of contaminated um, sources and pollution that these brownfields can be contributing. And so that's a lot of um, negative stuff, I think, with the history of, of brownfields. So what can be done? Um, you know, there's these vacant properties, there they're not productive use for the community. They're not contributing to the community's sense of well-being. What can actually be done about this? And so the EPA is actually, you know, here to to help you with the the brownfields, and they have their their brownfields and land revitalization program. And the goal is really to. Um, empower states, tribes, communities, and other stakeholders to work together to prevent, assess, safely clean up, and sustainably reuse brownfields. And so they provide grants related to understanding the contamination on properties, cleaning them up, planning for brownfield reuse, um, and they also fund technical assistance um, to providers like Groundwork USA who can then provide free support to communities in addressing these, these brownfields. And so how does that actually happen? So this is a graphic from the EPA of the brownfields process. And so we'll dive more into this process in the future um, in future webinars, but what you need to know is generally, you know, once you have one of those potential sites that you identified, 
um, in your community that you think is uh, a brownfield is there is assessments that happen to understand um, if there is contamination and if so, how much. Then there's planning for cleanup and reuse that's dependent on what type of contamination you have, what type of end use you want, and then really cleaning up the site so that you can transform the site. And so a very important part of this, you can see on the side, um, is community involvement. And that should be happening throughout the, the brownfield process. And so why should community involvement be happening throughout the process? Um, and that's really because of the environmental justice aspect of brownfields. So I mentioned before, the EPA estimates that there's over 450,000 brownfields in the U.S. And these are predominantly located in communities of color and low-income communities. Um, and the residents of these communities are the ones that are have been dealing with the consequences of these sites um you know for a while and they should be the ones who are able to take advantage of the different environmental health social and economic benefits that reusing these sites will bring and in order to make that happen we really advocate for implementing an equitable development um, structure so that we can or an equitable development strategy so that we can really meet the, the needs of the community, but also reduce inequalities and create healthy spaces for people to, to thrive um, in. And so thinking about equitable development, these are some principles that, you know, Groundwork USA uses and our partners when we're thinking about brownfield equitable development. So really sharing leadership and decision making. So making sure that everyone has access to the same information, um, whether that's from the assessment all the way through planning and to the actual reuse. Um, and everyone has a say in what um, the decisions that are made. Also acknowledging mistakes of the past so that they're not repeating themselves. Recognizing that those in the community are your local experts. They understand the ins and outs of their community. They can share some information that someone may have never, never even considered that can be super relevant to your process. And then also meeting people where they are. And so this is figuratively and literally. So, you know, actually going into the community and engaging people in, you know, near a site or, you know, if it's safe to go, you know, close to that site, taking a tour and really engaging people there rather than having them come to you at a public meeting and just thinking about other barriers to participation, whether that's language barriers or childcare. So really meeting people where they are. Um, and then lastly, really building trusting partnerships, you know, intentional trusting partnerships, getting everyone involved, neighbors, local businesses, your um, local governments, you know, no brownfield process can be done alone. As you'll see, it takes a lot of folks working together um, with a lot of trust to, to get this done. So I've talked about a lot of um, kind of environmental justice, brownfields. And so I'm curious before we kind of jump into kind of the relevance to nonprofits and the, the benefits of brownfield redevelopment. And we'll just throw the, the link for the, the poll in the chat. But yeah, I want to know what type of issue areas are you all working on? Is that, you know, the environment, yeah, housing. Yeah, education, recreation, community engagement in general, climate resilience. Yeah, what are you all, what are you all, I hope, contributing to trying to make the world a better place Great. So research on 
cumulative hazard exposure, transportation justice, redevelopment for mixed use, containing sprawl, environmental and housing, climate justice, resilience, climate resilience and community engagement, redevelopment for mixed use, urban flooding, brownfields and economic development, local pollution prevention, fluvial flooding, educational envisioning, workshops, parks, green infrastructure, brownfield in a local neighborhood, co-governance, rails to trails, addressing population decline within areas of environmental hazards, increasing green space for the community. Yeah, yeah, contaminated creeks. I feel like, yeah, I mean, again, you all knew what webinar you were coming to, but this is all super relevant to, to Brownfield's land reuse. Climate justice, especially related to gentrification and empowering communities to become healthier and more stable. That's important. Housing, EJ, recreation, community education, housing and justice, transit advocacy. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think I think we got all the answers that we're gonna get. Yeah. So thanks again for for sharing all of this. this. Is a lot of different stuff that you all are are working on. And so, what are the benefits of brownfields to communities? So removing potential and actual sources of contamination to the land, the water, the air, um, your community in general, um, which in turn improves public health. And there's also research that shows that that crime can be reduced by cleaning up vacant lots. You can also create greener communities that have less you know, vacant space. And then also building with climate resilience in mind. We know that a lot of infrastructure wasn't built for the changing climate. Um, and then also job creation. Jobs are important not only for um, cleaning up these brown fields, um, but whatever end use you decide, like the construction and also whatever end use you decide that makes the most sense for the communities that you're working on and the partnerships that you build. And so I realize my slides are out of order, but yeah, I think you all, you know, I think I saw a lot of this stuff in what you all just shared. Like I saw a lot of climate and like environmental advocacy. And so like green infrastructure can be a potential way that you transform a uh, brownfield, green and open space, urban agriculture, recreation, um, I think some people did say community education. So creating an educational facility and training centers, whether that's an actual physical building or an outdoor community educational space. Um, historic preservation, you know, is create a museum um, from, you know, a historic building that has been abandoned. Um, housing, I think I saw some housing people as well. Affordable housing developments or, you know, mixed housing developments or a absolutely something that can be um, created with brownfields. Workforce development, I don't know if I saw any of that, but brownfields clean up jobs, um, you know, is definitely something that can also be uh, a product of brownfield reuse. And the EPA also has mm -hmm. job training grants. Um, and then also I mentioned before construction jobs, like, you know, you need to, you need to build some of this, this infrastructure. Public health, I think this is a, a really important one. You can build health care facilities. A lot of these communities that have brown fields are more likely to have, you know, more community health issues, higher asthma, 
rates, higher incidences of cancer, there's a whole bunch of things and having access to healthcare can really be um, beneficial to, to communities. Um, arts and culture, um, just having a community center or incorporating art into the, the brownfield site that you develop, there's, there's so much p potential. And so, yeah, this is what, what they can be. You know, I already shared some of them on the last slide, but they can be parks, community gardens, office spaces, renewable energy developments. I think I did see some renewable energy folks in the room. Um, again, affordable housing, commercial space. Sometimes, you know, you, you need commercial space in your community as well. Trees and green space. Um, we do a lot of that in the Groundwork Network. Um, arts and cultural venues. And again, um, oh, thanks Susie for the Brownfields to Healthfields in the chat. But yeah, feel free to share any other kind of like end uses for Brownfield sites. And also, yeah, I should have mentioned like pop your questions in the chat. Like I said, we'll probably have a 20 minute Q&A um, soon. But yeah, keep the questions coming. Okay. And so, you know, we focused a lot on, you know, the benefits of non um, brownfields and, you know, this webinar is for nonprofits, but obviously this information is relevant to, to other um, organizations as well. But why, why nonprofits? Why do we think you all should consider taking on a brownfield process? Um, because you're really in a unique position to take on this land reuse process. Um, nonprofits, community-based organizations are really the ones who are leading the work in addressing all of these different kind of intersectional issues um, that you all mentioned in your communities. And you really are um, local experts of your community. You know the ins and outs, you work there, you work with residents, um, you work with the community, you're there. So your expertise is is so valuable. Um, and then also being a trusted partner in the, the community. Um, again, I think just from your experience working with people um, and trying to, you know, to, to change, um, the world for the better, I think, you know, people, people really trust you all. And so I want to quickly, briefly share some just example, equitable brownfield reuse transformations. Um, yeah, with you all before we, we hop into the, the Q&A. And so the first one that I want to share is the Sawmill River daylighting. So this is in Yonkers, New York, which is right outside um, north of New York City. And so basically industrialization, population growth, um, you know, and lack of space saw the Sawmill River um, covered over in certain places. And then around in the 1920s, um, mainly because of, you know, dumping and odors coming from the dumping and um, fear of waterborne disease, they, they covered the last bit of this sawmill river downtown, um, and it was covered by a parking lot, which you can see in this top picture here. And so led by Groundwork Hudson Valley, and many, many cross collaborative partnerships, they were able to daylight this um, river, which really just involves locating the river and uncovering um, um, the waterway. Um, and so now it serves as a, a waterfront park. It has, um, you can see the, the habitat along the river that was able to thrive once again. It also serves as a community gathering space. They have signage throughout the park, pedestrian pathways, um, and an outdoor outdoor classroom. And this is just a really great example of what uh, a parking lot 
potentially could be transformed into. And then, of course, you know, the surrounding area started to to come back to, to life as well. And this was really uh, an effort of the community, the nonprofit, and a bunch of different partners. And I've I've been to this um, waterfront park personally, and it really, really is um, great. Okay, another another example, Cincinnati, Ohio. So the Mill Creek River in Cincinnati was once considered one of the most endangered urban rivers in North America. And so property surrounding the river um, consisted of demolition debris, decaying parking lots, illegal dumping, suspected contamination just from a long history of industrial and commercial use. And so, and that's the, the top picture. And so a small nonprofit, the, the Mill Creek Restoration Project, which is now Groundwork Ohio River Valley, worked with the city, health departments, the National Park Service, the EPA, and other partners to create a plan for a greenway that provides a cleaner and greener creek, but also um, access to alternative transportation and recreation and open space. I think, again, we saw some transportation advocates in the room and, you know, this is the path that you can bicycle down. And so today, Groundwork Ohio River Valley is still working to extend this trailway even further um, and develop um, or to reuse even more brown fields to really make this not only, um, you know, really a community asset, but also, you know, thinking about climate resilience as well. And so this photo is a completed portion of the Greenway. Um, yeah. And so the last example I want to share is from Lawrence, Massachusetts. And so Lawrence, Massachusetts, former industrial city um, with very limited green space. Um, and so once the manufacturing left Lawrence, they were left with a lot of brownfield sites. And so this top picture, um, this site particularly was located adjacent to a former foundry. And so one of the, what you can see in this picture is like a mound of castings that, that came out of the metal processing. And this was also located along the, the polluted Spigot River um, in Lawrence, Mount Massachusetts. And so through the leadership of Groundwork Lawrence, and again, lots of lots of partners, the city, um, you know, businesses, residents, um, it's now a park along the Spigot River Greenway, which also has other reused brownfields along it. And so this park was really designed for passive recreation, um, educational and interpretive programs, events, um, a place where families can picnic, um, and just like really explore the natural world in the, the city. And so it includes pathways, panoramic views of the rivers and the cities, um, and then also that pavilion that you can see um, in the bottom picture for um, providing shelter from, from the heat um, and also a space for programming and gathering. Um, and this, yeah, this really shows, you know, what urban ecological restoration can look like. There's there's a lot of native plants in there um, and rain gardens and yeah, just a really great space for a community and the um on a site that used to have a, a big um industrial presence. Okay, so with that, I kind of wanna like how can brownfields benefit my community? I hope that, you know, some of these things that I've shared really, really showed how brownfields can transform communities. And so it really lends support to your mission-driven work um, that you all are already doing. Um, and so it's just another tool in your toolbox to support communities 
And really there's there's a lot of funding available to support reuse. And I think in the beginning, a lot of people did say, some people saw it challenging for brownfields and I definitely agree, but with the right partners and the right assistance and, and the right knowledge, I really think that, you know, this brownfield transformation really can be a tremendous opportunity for, for communities. And so with that, I'm curious, after talking about that, what are some words that come to mind when you think of brownfields? And we'll throw the, the link in the chat again for anyone who may need it. And it's okay if it's the same thing as before. Okay, environmental justice, opportunity, help. Okay, um, hopeful, intersectional solutions, Opportunity is still a big one, which was interesting that it was before um, and still. Health justice, community space. I don't think we saw community space or hopeful um, there. So I think that means, yeah, I didn't depress you all too much with all the brownfield talk. Scary, yeah. Critical. Yeah, critical solution for a lot of pressing issues. Isolated. I am interested to know a little bit more about that one. Alternative economies, community gardens, yeah. Coordination, renewed community, greater equity, yeah. Okay, we'll give it a little bit more time so we can have enough time for the Q&A. Okay, yeah, yeah, great. Well, yeah, thank you all so much. This is, it's nice to see how it did change, if any, of kind of what words are coming to mind when you're thinking of brownfields. So with that, oh, sorry, I forgot I have one more question. Will you consider exploring a brownfield reuse opportunity in your community? A lot of yeses. I think I see a little under 90 participants, though, so I'll give it a little bit more. Yes. So even with a scary, you're like, yeah, I'll still consider it. Then maybe. Okay, well, that is great. That is really great. I'm glad that you all are still considering um, some opportunities. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to my co-host, John Balanch, to, to lead us in the, the Q&A. Thanks, Jalisa. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Really excited for this presentation and discussion today. So I would welcome you to put your questions in the chat or use the raise hand feature uh, so that we can call on you and hear your question. Yeah, so I see a question here about what the funding resources are to develop brownfields. I actually think I have a link handy for you, but essentially, you know, there's a, a number of funds through the EPA's Office of Brownfields um, that I would, you know, kind of uh, direct you towards, and we can follow up with, with some links uh, on that. But there is a good deal of funding from the EPA. Of course, we also have our TAB providers that provide technical assistance uh, to communities that are impacted by brownfields. And so there's a, a real kind of um, established network that will provide both like the funding and the technical assistance for that. We also in the projects uh, often see 
you know, local municipal and uh, state involvement in addition to private sector involvement uh, as well. I see a question from Sophie. Do you wanna come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, howdy, thank you. This is super helpful, excited about the whole series. Um, uh, my question I assume will probably be answered in future um, meetings, but something I'm curious about is sort of how, especially when it comes to funding, which I think is probably what this is most relevant to, how strict is the definition of a brownfield? Like, I think there's a lot of areas that would be extremely well used, it, like not in their current state that, you know, all of those solutions that Jalisa mentioned would be really good there, but are they technically a brownfield? I don't know. Would that like disqualify us from certain funding? That's something I'm curious about. Yeah, that's a really great question, Sophie. Um, and I imagine one that others probably have uh, on this call as well. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure about that. Jaleesa, I don't know if you have an answer on that. And so, Sophie, if we don't have an answer for you, we can definitely um, get back to you on that. Yeah, Sophie, I think definitely something we'll explore in the next series. But in general, the brownfield, um, it's suspected of contamination. So the definition of a brownfield would be sites that are suspected are or actually contaminated. And so an assessment grant could be used to determine, you know, if a site's actually contaminated um, or or not. So there would be sources available. And yeah, we we can send more information about that. But yeah, basically like the phase one assessment um, is trying to determine, okay, are there contaminants on the site? Is this potentially contaminated? And then like a phase two would be trying to figure out how much it is contaminated. So since a lot of it is around like, you know, uncertainty around contamination. I think a lot of sites that you potentially have in mind would probably be, be eligible. Thanks for that, Jaleesa. And again, for the question, Sophie. So I see a question in the comments. Um, and before I get to that, I just want to encourage everyone, if you're not putting your questions in the comments, feel free again to use the raise hand function and um, ask your question. So um, there's one from Sierra here about the difference between Superfund sites and brownfields. Um, as I understand it, um, Superfund sites are governed under CERCLA, which is federal law. And I believe that the key difference is that they're uh, oftentimes much larger sites um, and, and that brownfields are typically kind of smaller sites. And so we know, for instance, that there's a rough estimate that there are about 400,000 or approximately 400,000 of brownfield sites uh, across the country. Um, and my understanding is that they're typically uh, smaller uh, sites. And much super funds are much more polluted. The, the amount of contamination in super funds is like, you know, a lot more than your typical brownfield. Great, I see a question from uh, Catherine. Yeah, thank y'all. Um, is there, any type of brownfield that cannot be reused like like it's good to know like what is not possible so that, like when dreaming it can get really frustrating when we hit it up against that yeah that's a really fantastic question so i think that the short answer is that it really all depends um as as general and vague as that might sound but a specific example uh, comes from uh, an engagement that groundwork usa had a few years ago with a group the environmental justice movement of Flint that was really interested in evaluating the prospects for transformation of a former auto manufacturer site. It was a relatively large parcel and there was kind of a divide in the community about what types of reuse strategies should be pursued. And so some in the community thought, let's bring back those industrial manufacturing jobs. Why don't we kind of use this site for the potential that it once had um, and really kind of bring back that value to, to workers and to the community in, in terms of economic development. And others said, well, why don't we do gardens and parks and bring recreation and green space and open space opportunities for our young people and for our community in general? And so um, what we found was that by creating a GIS dashboard and, of course, bringing in partners who uh, environmental engineers and 
having others actually evaluate the level of contamination across the site and then mapping that, it allowed the community to have a much more informed conversation about realistic expectations around redevelopment. And so I think, you know, my my longer answer to you is really like, it, it depends. And I think specifically considering the level and type of contamination um, should inform kind of what types of, of reuse strategies uh, you'll use. I see there's a question also about kind of acquisition of sites from private owners and whether or not the site is vacant, but doesn't want to touch it because it's contaminated. Yeah, Michelle, I think that um, in this case, you know, a few things could happen, right? But the ones that are coming to mind right now is, you know, you could have a very kind of distant absentee landlord that might just want to sit on the property and, you know, might actually be concerned about the costs of remediation and might not want to get involved. Um, and perhaps that they're waiting for the right time to redevelopment or the right opportunity. And so I think either way, you know, there is an opportunity to work with your existing ecosystem of nonprofits, um, community development organizations, and your city and or state to see if there's a way to leverage those partnerships to engage the site owner to see if they're interested in working uh, with those stakeholders to explore opportunities to redevelop the land. But certainly, you know, I would say those those types of engagements can take um, a lot of time, but it's absolutely worth kind of connecting with the stakeholders in your area to see if there's an opportunity to approach that owner. Jalisa, there's a question in the chat from uh, Almariette Roberts about resources that we could provide to community members who are interested in to kind of move a brownfield redevelopment process along. And so do you wanna maybe talk about the Equitable Resource Hub? Yeah, yeah. Do we want to see if there's any more questions? Then we can chat about it in the next the next slides. But that's yeah. Thanks, Almarie, for that question. Um, but I think yeah, probably have time for more one more, and then we can move into some of the resources. Hi everyone. I had a quick question. Um, I was I actually. Question. Oh, sorry. I was actually trying to see what the legal obligations of homeowners are or like, you know, if a city is trying to acquire that property, who is if there is any like legal uh, pressure to clean up a property or can you all explain kind of how that process works or if there's any legislation on that type of, you know, like if you want to buy something. Yeah, yeah, this is a great question, Natalie. Um, and the short answer is like, yes, definitely like a big part of the brownfield process that that I think we'll we'll dive into in the part two of this series um, is like due diligence and like the idea of before you even think about purchasing a property or anything, really making sure that you you understand if there is any contamination on the property so that you're not liable um, for for any cleanup or anything like that. And the, so there's a lot to the process that this isn't my area of expertise, but some of our partners that that we'll work with on the next webinar will will dive into this a little bit more deeply. But yeah, definitely there there are things that you should consider before you even touch a property, thinking about buying it or accepting a property to make sure that you're you're protected from you know liabilities around like cleanup. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out if if you want to chat about it more before the the second session, and we can send some resources. But yeah, that's that's a really great question. Awesome, thank y'all. I'm excited to hear about the next session then. All right, John, should we end the Q and A? And if there weren't any questions that we got into the chat. Um, you know, feel free to follow up with us or we'll we'll address them and you know in future sessions. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right, Jalisa. I think we should go and, and, and move ahead. But I do just want to put in a plug there for uh Ricardo in the chat. It's asking about engaging with nonprofits in island communities. It's not something that Groundwork USA has really engaged in, but you know, Jalisa and I are gonna talk about the Equitable Resource Hub, and I would encourage you to check that out. I think that 
Of course, there are going to be really novel dynamics, I think, engaging and organizing uh, and conducting outreach um, in island communities. Uh, and yet some of the organizing principles that Jalisa was talking about earlier, such as meeting people where they're at, um, will still apply. So we've got a couple of resources, I think, that, that might help at that, at that level uh, for your engagement. Thanks so much, John. Um, all right, so back to Amrit's question about some resources. So Groundwork USA, we have the Equitable Development Resource Hub, which is has a lot of resources around like equitable development, specifically around brownfield re redevelopment. Um, and yes, like check that out um, as a starting point or kind of thinking about more any questions that you have lingering. Um, and also, I think the three um, examples that I shared, there's a resource, um, I think maybe it's like Brownfield's highlights from around the network that go deeper into some of the, the case studies or examples that, that we shared, but a lot of different resources in there. And that as part of this grant, we will be adding to this, adding more visual um, materials as well and, and different types of mediums. So, so please check that out. Um, and then also the technical assistance to Brown Pro brownfield programs or tab providers. And so, you know, we, we provide technical assistance, but the EPA also has regional technical assistance providers that, you know, are experts in brownfields and they provide technical assistance to communities, states, tribes, other pu public entities, everyone who's interested in redeveloping a brownfield site. Um, and they're organized by the different EPA regions. So I think if also if you want more, if you have a project that you have in mind right now too, they're also a really, really great resource. Um, and last is the, the EPA. Um, yeah, their website has a lot of fact sheets, a lot of information. Um, if there's anything in particular that you, you're looking for, reach out. I can probably help you find it. They have a wealth of information. Um, and then also the regional brownfield offices as well are also another great um, resource for, for you all. And I think some of these tab, we, we put the link for the tab providers, but there's some tab providers on the call here today. So yeah, uh, a lot of people here to uh, support the, the work. Um, okay, and yeah, so additional opportunities. So we'll have the Brownfield Curious sessions number two and three. And just to reiterate, the second session will more be focused on the actual Brownfield remediation process from beginning to end, talking about the steps, the different stakeholders, the timelines, diving a little bit deeper um, into all of that, that fun stuff. And then the third session will be on um, the roles of nonprofits. So how do you all, you know, fit into this and how you can actually, you know, start to, to lead a, a brownfield land reuse um, process. We'll also have a nonprofit speaker series where you will hear from, um, nonprofits across the country who have um, led brownfield um, reuse processes and, and they'll share their experiences and their projects. Um, and then skills-based workshops will also have that, you know, focus on brownfields, but also environmental justice, equitable development. Um, and then our last one is a nonprofit coaching cohort. So this is specifically for nonprofits. It's a six month coaching learning cohort will really help you all have all the tools and information mm -hmm. um, to be able to take on brownfield land reuse from beginning to end. And this will be launching in the fall. So for all of this, um, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. You can scan that QR code on the, the screen. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in our nonprofit coaching cohort, also there's a question at the end of the, the webinar feedback survey, um, if you'd like more information to be added to our list for, for when we start announcing everything. So 
So yeah, if anyone wants to scan this QR code, if not, we'll all follow up with you in the an email with the recording of this webinar. Um, yeah. All right, so with that, just want to thank you all so much for um, joining us today for all your great questions and participation in, in our polls. Um, I know John and I are so appreciative of you, you all um, attending and participating. So if you have any questions, if there is something that we didn't get to um, get to when we were um, doing the Q&A, feel free to reach out to, to myself or John at the, the emails below. Um, and yeah, complete the survey, which John just sent in the chat right at 3 p.m. So again, yeah, surveys are really helpful. We really listen to them. Um, yeah, thank you all. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>